saints, this is Mina Lee Jones with Faithful Walk Healing Ministries. And today is Thursday, January 18th. And I'm coming to you today with a word or multiple words that the Lord has given me for this particular season. And so with this particular video, I'm going to suggest that you grab a pen and paper. Because we're going to go over several things today. Um, unlike my previous videos where like it's either a dream or just a single word or a single scripture that the Lord has given me for a particular time, a particular season, a year, whatever the case may be. Um, I actually have a collaboration of things that I would like to share with you all for 2024 moving forward. Now, looking at this, we can say right now we've entered into 2024 according to the Gregorian calendar, if that's what you follow. Uh, some will say we entered into 2024 if you follow the the civil or secular Hebrew calendar that is observed by Israel that happened um, during High Holy Days, which was September of last year. Some people counted for that. Or you can count it on a biblical calendar, which is according to what's in the scripture in Exodus, which is from spring to spring, a beep to a beep, or Nisan to Nisan, which occurs in the spring of this year. So actually it doesn't matter which calendar you're following. Understand that this word is for this particular season moving forward. Now I began talking about what we've entered into right now a couple years ago. And I began to talk about the importance of, or of these next two years. I was mentioning this even in 2022. Because I knew that the next two years would be of dire significance for the world, for the body of Christ, the church, and even for this nation. However, I knew that with the next two years that was approaching, that the things would dramatically begin to decline as I began to talk about at the beginning of 2022. And so here we are, we are in 2024. And the whole time frame was more so not just winding down to 2024, but really the beginning of 2025. So I'm going to share some things with you. And like I said, get that pen and paper, or if you want to save this to your watch later and come back and look at it again and again, then do so. Um, there are some things that I'm going to share on here. I'm not going to be able to share everything um, that I would like to just because of censorship. Okay, so I'm letting you know that. However, we have some newsletters that are going out at the beginning of this year. Um, and I'm also contemplating doing a podcast, which I will upload later on, that will give more detail about what the Lord is showing me. And in addition to that, not just what God is showing me, what I've been following over the course of about 14 years that are leading up to the events that we are currently being faced with. In addition to that, just talking about headlines that are going on in the world as a whole and how they prophetically fall into line with end time events, okay? So the, the things that I want to share, the first thing that I want to talk about this, this afternoon and about this season, probably one of the most important things that I have noticed um, that is happening right now with particularly within the Western church. I'm not going to say the body of Christ because we know that everyone who is in the church is not necessarily a part of the body of Christ. One of the things that is, is it has been going on, but for whatever reason, not, I shouldn't say with that, whatever, we know what the season is. It's the season. Um, the last two years. This has been such a huge increase amongst what is supposed to be believers, Christians, evangelicals, whatever you want to call yourself, whatever category you would like to put yourself in. And this has to do with the rise of really the apostate church. But the reason why the apostate church is rising in such a, a fashion we know that the scripture tells us Paul references it in Thessalonians when he talks about until the falling away happens first or the apostasy then has to happen first before the return of the Lord. And then after that, it, following that, 
uh, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the beast, the antichrist, whichever one you want to call him, a pseudo Christ, uh, makes his appearance, not necessarily saying that no one knows who he is, but the appearance as far as like taking his rightful place for the tribulation, what we call the, the great tribulation. So prior to that happening, Paul lets us know that an apostasy would take place and the apostasy is defined as the falling away from the truth. So that means that in order to fall into the category of being apostate means that you had to at one point have known the truth. You had to have walked in the light, so to speak. We're not talking about your occasional church goers, people who go to church just because that's what grandma told them to do or they go to church because it's a holiday it's easter if you celebrate easter it's passover or, or whatever the the different mother's day is another day that people like to go to church we're not talking about that we're talking about people who actually as hebrews talks about those who have understood the things that have even seen and tasted the things to come who have partaken in the and the glory and the light and so those type of people, in other words, they know the truth. They've, they've been in their word. They have, um, they understand a, a relation, what it is perhaps even what it is to have a relationship with Christ. Perhaps I say that perhaps, but the point is, is that these people had ample amount of time, um, to understand truth in its entirety, to understand the season that we're in. And yet they end up for whatever reason or reasons falling away from the truth. And so there's a great falling away. It's not just a, a, a group of folks here or there, but there's like this massive falling away that takes place as Paul states is called the apostasy. This has been going on for many years now. In fact, I still remember how the beginning of 2017, I'd gone away to fast and pray. Um, on the beach and the Lord spoke to me that time and told me that that would be the year that we would begin to really see um, the exposure of the apostate church or the growth of the apostate church. So for me counting back to 2017 until now, it has been a number of years. We're in, we're in 2024. Um, so we're talking the last seven years or so um, that this has taken place. However, um, then, but the last two years, I have just seen this substantial amount of falling away. Now we could go and we're not going to go, but we can, you know, just generally, um, mention some of the things that you and I have, have seen, you know, there's, this is a season where a lot of things are being exposed. A lot of ministries are being exposed. Um, from grand ministries that have been around for multiple decades to even smaller ministries, um, the ones that we're not so familiar with, yet they're being put into the limelight of exposure uh, for debaucheries and perversions and, and just really, in some cases, really heinous things and horrible accusations, um, some of which people have claimed to be false, while others say it's true. Um, I don't really see, at least with the grand ones, I should say, anything being a falsification because several of those, not all, several of those people, even the ones who have claimed, come back and claim that they were false allegations, the Lord actually showed me several years prior um, that these particular ministers um, would basically have the, the stands, the stand, so to speak, kicked from underneath them or the chair kicked from underneath them. So we're seeing a lot of that. And on one end, some Christians would say, okay, this is a wonderful thing. God is exposing darkness. Um, but it's really a double-edged sword. And I'll tell you why. Because, because of the level of technology that we have today, we've got not just news and we have, you know, social media. Everything is at, you know, news is at the click of a fingertip, basically. So because of the widespread availability um, to get information in today's society, the double-edged sword is like on one end, us in the church, we could say, well, hey, um, God is exposing the darkness. Okay, this is great. Well, he said he would, he would do this, and he did, okay? But on the other side to it, what it's doing 
is it's giving Christianity as a whole specifically, and I do want to specify this, specifically the, uh, the evangelical church, a black eye, so to speak, um, given reasons for the world to further come against uh, who is deemed a Christian. Okay, so there's a double-edged sword in this, all right? Now, we know that before God judges the world, he said he will judge the church first. The house of the Lord has to first come into judgment. At least that what is portrayed to be the house of the Lord has to fall into judgment first before he judges the entire world. Well, the world gets judged during what we know as the Great Tribulation, so which is just right around the corner. And so what we're seeing right now is a part of that judgment coming to the house of the Lord first, that sword, okay? But again, the double-edged part to that is that it's also with the publicity that these things are getting, and not just here in the United States, these are ministers in other countries that are being exposed. Um, some are already dead, unfortunately, um, that have been exposed or are being exposed for many things that they were doing, that are doing, what have you, that are full of just wickedness, absolute wickedness. Um, but the agenda, I will say, behind the exposure of it, as far as the media sense is concerned, and I can tell you this, this is an actual fact, and I have, um, I've been given information to back this up, like factual information. The agenda behind the exposure, I'm not talking about someone on social media saying I'm going to expose this person. I'm talking about like media, like television, um, news or what have you, or uh, secular uh, news articles, things of that nature, is to really demonize it, Christianity as a whole. So what it's really setting up, saints, is the persecution of the true Christians. Because they're not going to separate us, the true bride, from them, who is the apostate bride. They're not going to separate this. They don't understand scripture. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they're going to throw everybody and are throwing everybody into the same category. And this is what's going to line up for the absolute total uh, persecution of the Christians across the world. Now, Persecution of Christianity has been going on for two millennia, okay? And in some places, more it's more hostile than other places. But what we're entering into in this season is a global, okay? A global form of per persecution against Christianity, which this too must come to pass, okay? This too is also prophetic about the end times. And so we're, this is what is beginning to form in front of our eyes while we're reading the articles or listening to the tapes or the click, clicking on the videos or the documentaries or whatever the case may be. Know that the agenda behind that publicity is to really place Christians all in one bucket as bad people so that the world will have a reason. And when I say the world, I mean those who are of the world will have a further reason to um, discriminate, to be prejudiced against us, to persecute us, to imprison us, to even put us to death. I even had a recent dream as of this morning regarding just that about being uh about christians being falsely accused and hunted down by police and i'm talking here in this country and being placed um in prison basically under false pretenses so i the lord just gave that to me this morning i just had a dream about it this morning we've already seen a very good example of that here in this country with the former um, gentleman who had come here from Denmark and who is no longer here, who was placed 
um, under arrest for over a year without proper charges, never given a lawyer, never properly standing before a judge, only in the end to be uh, deported, okay? And when that situation arose, the Lord told me a year ago, a little over a year ago, that he would be a sign, he would be a sign to what is coming to the rest of the Christians here in America. I actually shared that on a video, a previous video that I did where the Lord gave that to me in the beginning of last year, if you want to go and check that out. So these things are falling into place. So now this gentleman is no longer here, but thank God he was released or what have you. But we've got all of this exposure that is going on right now. And, you know, they're saying, oh, it's the devil's the devil. It's a double-edged sword. There is judgment coming to the house of the Lord on one end of that sword, okay? For those who have not dealt with the sins lurking at their hearts, that's what it boils down to. The thing is, the Bible tells us that it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. We all deal with some forms of judgment, but God gives us the opportunity to correct sin in our lives. And there is that time frame, okay, where he allows you like, do it right, do it right. Or he's going to do it for us in that sense. And so when when the Lord's discipline, when the Lord's wrath comes down, it's not a good thing. Though it may still, if it doesn't take your life, be of mercy to save your soul. Even Paul talks about turning a person over, their flesh over to Satan that their soul be saved, okay? So these things can happen and God is in control of all of it, of course. And there are various reasons as to why he allows it. But some people unfortunately end up dying in their sins and then it's later exposed what exactly those people were into. And now we see why the Lord allowed them to perish, okay? So there's this massive increase of apostasy across the board. It is actually quite concerning. Um, in the process of all of the exposures of, of well-known ministers or what have you, we have a lot of other things going on behind the scenes, I just say, or in the smaller community, so to speak. And it's the rise of this addiction, and I'm going to use the term addiction to prophecy, which is quite dangerous. Now, I myself have operated prophetically for many years now. Um, we're going on, we're nearing two decades of ministry at this point. However, my sole purpose and focus, especially for Faithful Wall Healing Ministries per se, has never been revolved around prophecy. It has been revolved around ministry, being in the field, tending to the lost, um, deliverance, healing, um, missions, etc., training, discipleship, all of these different things um, we've been in the field dealing with and not focusing on prophecy because prophecy is going to be prophecy no matter what. But prophecy, no amount of prophecy, fulfilled or unfulfilled, can bring anyone into heaven. So it doesn't matter whether or not a prophecy is accurate or when it happens or when it doesn't happen. If you don't have a relationship with the king, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, who is also named as Yeshua, then it's not going to matter. Somebody can prophesy to you or prophesy about something occurring all day long. But if you don't know the voice of the true shepherd, the good shepherd, then it's not going to matter because you won't make it in. And so this is what I'm seeing an increase of. And I'm talking to other ministers, friends of mine and acquaintances and the backdrops because the Lord has allowed me to befriend and have relationships with quite a few ministers across the globe, not just here in the United States. And I'm hearing the same thing from them is something that is happening widespread where people are really being drawn away from the core value of what uh, the core thing is a relationship, an actual true relationship with the king, okay? And so, and I've even seen people try to, you know, 
uh, combat it, try to rebuttal that, you know, oh, we're saved by faith and faith alone, but faith without works is dead. <laughs> so there's more to it than just sitting at home and saying, I believe in Jesus. Well, the demons believe in him as well. So we, we have to produce fruit. We have to be refined. We have to uh, have the discipline of the soul and, and not allowing our fleshly this. And there's multiple scriptures, multiple scriptures in the New Testament and the Old that back that up about not being led by the flesh, being led by the spirit. Um, faith without works is dead, as I said earlier. Um, my sheep know my voice, a stranger they will not follow. All of these things, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into my kingdom. All of these different scriptures that prove that at the end of the day, if we don't have a solid relationship with Jesus Christ, then we will not make it, okay? But what we have is, is really that this, this explosion of prophecy, and I'm going to specifically approach that because it's not even an explosion of just churches to go to on Sunday or Tuesday night or Wednesday night or Shabbat or whatever you do when you fellowship or wherever you go to fellowship, but specifically, specifically prophecy that people have become obsessed with. And so the devil, Satan, who is the accuser, he sees and has seen this flaw, okay? And so what has happened is there has been this enormous rapid increase of people, quote unquote, who are prophets, okay? Male and female, okay? And they are all over social media, okay? And so I don't pay attention to much what's on the internet. I mean, I pay attention to like news or what have you. As far as like uh, who's trending in the prophetic world, I'm very ignorant to it because I just simply don't care because I, I'm in the field and my I've got enough <laughs> on my plate. But more importantly, I'm trying to be in tune with the Holy Spirit who is the truth bearer and making sure that I'm doing exactly what the Lord has told me to do, especially now in this season. So I, I don't pay attention to who's trending. I couldn't name anyone really honestly off the top of my head that's trending because I don't care. However, what has happened is that I have had from conversations from other friends, I'm talking, I've gone and stayed with ministers, spent time with them. They're asking me about certain people. Then there's individuals who have written to me, written to this ministry, uh, written to other folks or what have you, asking or sending um, all of these various people that are out here who, and everybody's a prophet, everybody's a prophet. Like, Have you heard this? But did you listen to this? Did you listen to that? So we've, we've had this discussion, me and quite a few of our friends, um, people that I trust as for accountability, uh, people who have been in ministry way longer than I've been in ministry. And those who um, are just at my level, and I will say that because we, I make sure I surround myself with a variety of people for accountability because none of us can do this by ourselves because we're human and we're subject to error. And we're noticing this trend, and so we've been talking about it, and the most of these people, we're getting checks in our spirit regarding them. Um, and one in particular recently, the Lord had spoken to me about who I just didn't know anything about. Um, but the Lord brought this person to my attention, me and my husband's attention several months ago. And I didn't even understand why the Lord was even bringing this to me. Um, and he, and he told me he wanted me to see something pertaining to this person. And it took, a, it took, it didn't take a while. I, it, it took an hour maybe if even that, uh, to figure out where the leaven was. Um, so it's very quick. And, and then as time went on, more and more leaven came out about this person. Remember that Jesus said, he told the disciples in reference, even, even to the Pharisees to be careful of the leaven. You remember that in the scripture? So later on, we, it, the scripture talks about a little leaven, leaven being yeast. Okay. That causes the entire loaf to rise. It just takes a little bit of yeast. If you've ever um, made bread or donuts or anything of that, name, anything that's pertaining to or needing um, yeast as an ingredient, then you will know that it only takes just a little bit, just a pinch 
to to make the entire dough um, begin to rise. So, and when Jesus was talking about is that leaven, that leaven, just a little bit of darkness, just a little bit of a lie. This is a, and and so, but what is happening? What is happening? It is so important, saints, and I want you all to hear me out. What is happening? is that people are overlooking the leaven, okay? And so they're like, well, we're overlooking that. Oh yeah, well, they may say that. Well, I don't believe that. But then they said this, and this part is, is accurate. And what I want you to understand is that I want you to remember how Satan operates. Please listen to this. You know, when, when, when the serpent deceived Eve in the garden, Okay, and I'm gonna give you this analogy for a reason. When he deceived Eve in the garden, he came to her, wait till she was alone, right? Adam wasn't with her, her covering wasn't with her, her accountability wasn't with her. Hear me out, okay? Listen to what I'm saying. And then he begins to question her about what God had told them or instructed them to do, okay? And so she responds, but even her response is inaccurate. So if you go back into Genesis, Eve says, we're not to eat or touch of any fruit in the garden. So that's not actually what God said. She added something on to it. But the serpent replies and says to her, um, the first thing was that you will not die. So we know obviously that was a lie because because of that, because of Adam and Eve eating this fruit is the reason why we face death, eternal death without Christ and physical death, okay? And so he, the first thing he says is that she would not die. We know that was a lie. But then he says, you will be like God. Your eyes will be open and you will know both good and evil. Well, saints, that, that was truth. That was truth. And so the analogy that I give a lot when I use the, the, the example of the serpent in the garden to people, whether I'm teaching classes or Bible study or conferences or doing one-on-ones or whatever the case may be, I say, you have to understand how Satan beguiled the woman. He didn't come to her with a hundred percent lie, you know? He came to her with two parts truth and one part lie because two things he said were true. And one thing he said was a lie. That was the leaven. That was the seduction. It was the leaven, okay? So it only takes a little bit of leaven to make the whole lump rise. And this is what Jesus was warning in the scriptures. And so when we look at the serpent beguiling the woman, this is what he did. He added the leaven in, told her most truth, but there was a there was one part lie. Okay. And because of that, the whole world fell. <laughs> and so I'm um, the reason why I want to bring that analogy up now in this season, because it's so incredibly important is because the church, the bride is considered female. Okay. And, and she is betrothed to her bride groom, all right, who has gone away to prepare a place for us. Okay, and that place, by the way, is, is pretty much done. And so he is headed back to, to grab his bride. But while he's been away, the serpent has been in the tree trying to beguile the church with that leaven. Okay, and so if you are not, if you are not solid, hear me out, okay? solid in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Here's what I mean when I say that. Okay. So, well, I'm saved. I've got baptized. I, you know, I've speak in tongues. Some of you do, some of you don't. I mean, that's not a salvation issue, but I'm sitting here at it. Some people do, some people don't. And you're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm solid. I belong to a church, a ministry group, a prayer group, whatever the case may be. Okay. <laughs> but remember, that still doesn't define your relationship because people go to church all the time, all right? People can prophesy, again, going back to Matthew chapter seven, and not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, right? Can, it will enter into my kingdom. So that solid relationship where he knocked at your door and you opened it and he allowed him in. Remember, this is what he calls, he accused the church of, or, or said to the church of Laodicea. It was a church, was it not? It wasn't just some worldly place, it was a church. But, but yet Christ is standing on the outside and he's knocking at the door. So he's on the outside 
And he's saying, let me in. Okay. So you let me in. And then he says, we will, we will sit down and we will have a meal together. Now the NLT says, we'll be friends. So it, it has to do with a relationship and intimacy with the king. The, the high priest that sat on the inner court of the temple. There was all the noise in the outer court, but the intimacy was in the quiet was in the inner court, which is where the table of shoe bearer, the menorah, the altar of incense were all are all representing and the Holy of Holies, which was in the most innermost place as well. And the priest was allowed to, was only allowed to go in there once a year, but it was for atonement to sprinkle the blood on the altar. So our high priest, whose name is Yeshua, Jesus, whose priesthood is in the same order as Melchizedek, spoken in Hebrews. He longs for that intimacy, but he's on the inner court, okay? So again, that relationship, having that relationship, again, Jesus says again and again and again in Matthew, I don't know you. I Verily I say unto you, I do not know you. Remember that, no, to know someone. It's a difference between knowing of someone and knowing someone. Two totally different things. Most people don't, they know of me. You know me based on an, a, a YouTube video, a post, or somewhere following on social media. Maybe you've come to a conference or two that we've had across the country uh, and other countries even because we've been in Europe and Latin America, all these things. So, or, or maybe you heard something awful about me. Maybe you heard somebody say, you know, well, this person is this way or that way, or maybe it was negative things that you heard about me, but you've never been to my house. You know what I'm saying? There's a difference between knowing of Mina Lee Jones and hearing what everybody says about her or hearing what she says or reading what she says and then sitting at my table. And that's like, that's a different encounter. You know, have you been to my house? Have you, have you ate my food? Have I cooked a meal for you? Um, there are people that can say that. There are people who have said they know me personally. They've been inside my home. They've been, you know, they've had personal conversations with me. So that brings it to a different level. And so this is what Christ is wanting. He doesn't want us to just know of him. But, but I'm saying to you, many people in the church know of him, but they actually haven't had an encounter with him. And so because of that, there it when you stay at that level now in the beginning it's fine you know in the beginning we all have to start somewhere right but after a certain amount of time that has gone by years even and we still haven't had a true encounter with Christ. I'm not talking about going to a revival and, and you're crying because the music is good or what have you. I'm talking about that quiet time, that he who dwells in the secret place of the most high, that go behind, go into your secret place and close the door behind you situation that Jesus talks about, that David talks about, that intimacy. Where he's told, he said, I speak to Moses mouth to mouth. I don't speak to him in parables. I speak to him mouth to mouth. That type of intimacy with God. And so once you have that encounter, and, 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 it's, and it's a different thing from just knowing of him. But again, we have so many Christians who are continuously seeking after the things of God. What are the things of God? Well, we could talk, we're just talking about prophecy, right? These are the things of God that we would consider, okay? Uh, the things of God, miracles, impartations, mantles, ministries, titles, endorsements, um, fellowship, synagogues, temples, churches, uh, whatever the case may be, okay? Things of God, you know, eschatology, theology, okay? Even though I don't deal with that, but people, some people are scholars. People like to read. Everybody's got a thousand books. Where everybody wants to write a book about something, this and that, that and this. And so we have all of these encounter. We have all of these ideas and sometimes other people's testimonies, but we don't have our own personal testimony. So we're living off of someone else's encounter with God when we're buying all these books and we're listening to all these videos and these documentaries and these movies. We're literally listening to someone else's encounter with God and yet we don't have our own. And so when we don't have our own encounter with God, lacking that intimacy, okay? Again, my sheep will know my voice. Later on, he says, a, a stranger, they will not follow, okay? So... If you know his voice, then you won't be deceived. Then you'll recognize the leaven, 
when it's in front of you, but because people are lacking encounters with God, it allows the enemy to come in and to deceive them. And that is what's happening widespread, widespread. It's very grievous. It's very concerning. And I'm seeing it in droves and I'm just like, you know, and I don't have time. I'm not a person to go and put out videos about this particular person. First of all, it's not my job, okay? And and, and I know some of you like, oh, no, we got to expose it. I, when the Lord tells me to say something, I say something. Other than that, the ministry group that we have, the people that I train and the different sects of ministry, some people I'm training for ministry, some people we have as disciples of faith, walk in the ministries, whatever the case may be. As God leads, I will warn. But I'm telling you all today, I don't need to name names. What I'm saying to you is that if you have discernment and wisdom, if you have the discipline of the soul because you're not led by the flesh, then you too will know. So if you don't know, then you need to go into the secret place. You need to make sure that you're not quenching the Holy Spirit, that you're not finding yourself like a prophecy junkie. OK, and I had someone write me that was saying um, there's nothing wrong with being a prophecy junkie. Yes, it is. First of all, the word junkie is a is a derogatory term. So it's not something you would want to label yourself as anyways. That's a term that I use when people go from conference to conference to conference or YouTube video to YouTube video, whatever the case, always looking for a word. But they've had no encounter with God. Now, there's nothing wrong with, with understanding eschatology, understanding the signs of the times. But I remember like about eight years ago, nine years ago, the Lord spoke to me about even, even the scripture where he talked about keeping watch. And he was telling me that his children had misinterpreted that scripture because I've, he, a lot of people, and I've heard it over the years, has, and I was one of them. Let me start by saying that. I didn't even understand that the fullness of that interpretation of that scripture until about nine years ago, okay? And that's why he came to me and told me this. When you say keep watch, we think, oh, we got to watch for the signs. We got to watch Israel. We got to, you know, look, look up in the sky. We got to read the news headlines. We got to click on the videos or what have you. That's not what he meant. Because when you go into that scripture, he says, if the master of the house knew the hour in which the thief was going to come, he would have stayed and prevented his house from being broken into. So think about that. And he says, then he follows up with, so you too must keep watch for you do not know the day or the hour the son of man is coming. So what are you watching? You're not looking outside for up in the sky. You're not looking across the street at your neighbor's house to see if they got their porch light on or if they closed their garage door or if they got rats. It's what's going on on the inside. If the master of the house knew the hour the thief was coming, the thief was coming to his house, his threshold, his temple. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's what the Lord was talking about. It's it's following up and making sure that your robe is washed, <laughs> that you're without spot or wrinkle, that you have oil in your lamp and that you're not um, those 10 brides. Right. They were all looking for the bridegroom. That that wasn't the problem. The bridegroom was coming. They knew he was coming. They were expecting him to come. They were looking for him to come. They had gone out to meet him. But their inner court was untamed. Their inner court was untapped. The five that were foolish. You understand what I'm saying? Because five of them left that house, whatever house they were in, they left their house without oil. That was an internal error that caused them to not be ready when the bridegroom came. They were there. They were physically there, but they weren't ready. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, so this is what the Lord is saying. So because of this, the deception is running rampant. Now, I know this is a little bit of a different type of video than what you all have been used to with me. But this is what we're in a different season. And we're supposed to move into different seasons. I've changed seasons multiple times. <laughs> and since, even since 2015, since most of you all, like I can't even stand to hear myself talk from 2015. I'll be honest with you. I've had a lot of people talk about that. I'm like, I don't even play nothing back from 20. I can't stand it. The Lord has changed me so much since 2015, 2016. He's humbled me, refined me, rebuked me, reproved me, grown me, matured me, all of that or what have you. So we're supposed to be moving into different seasons. 
as we get closer and closer to it, you don't just arrive. First of all, you don't arrive as long as you're in this life. There's no arrival. Arrival should be there in heaven. Is sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. That should be your arrival set. You don't arrive here. As long as you're in this life and in this flesh suit, you're subject to refinement. You're because you're subject to error. Because you're human. Okay. And so you have to allow yourself to be pliable, to be teachable. I see it's all the time. People are no longer teachable. This is all a part of the apostasy. People are no longer teachable. They sit behind a computer with the camera set up and they think they've got all the answers and you can't tell me anything because I understand the scriptures of this and that is not possible. No human being outside of Jesus Christ knows all the scripture. No human being can interpret all the word of God. Here's the reason, even if you're not just a part of the church, but a part of the bride, you're many members, but one body. So guess what? Your assignment is probably to be a thumb. And so if you're a thumb, you don't know how to function as a gallbladder. And if you're a gallbladder, you don't know what it's like to function in the left lung. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is why we need the body of Christ. Unfortunately, there's so much division in the church today. And people like to follow the Pied Piper off of cliffs. And so we're missing it. No one has all the answers. I definitely don't have all the answers, but I've been given the portion that I've been given and God has matured it because I've, I've opted to remain teachable and to remain reprovable and, and allow God to chastise me and, and put me in the direction that he wants me to be in and not be like a mule or a horse with a bit in its mouth that hey, we have to inflict pain to get them to do what you want them to do because of rebellion and stubbornness. I've chosen not to do that. And we all should be like that. We should be choosing to stay pliable, to stay teachable. Because that's only then that God can really begin to expand our walls. Okay. So great deception is upon the church. There's a double-edged sword. The thing that the, the first thing I want to tell you that the Lord spoke to me for this season is that he was this season, he was separating the sheep among the sheep. Now, I put that post out on one of my social media outlets of um, several weeks ago, and I had several people come back and like they, they tried to correct me. And they're like, no, this, no, sister, this, the scripture is this sheep among the goats. It's a, no, it's the sheep among the sheep. I'm going to give you the three scriptures in regards to that. And I'm going to read them to you so that you can understand what the Lord was saying. Because he had been talking to me for the last month regarding this about the sheep among the sheep, separating the sheep among the sheep. And it's going to fall into place with everything that I just said to you um, a few minutes ago. So the first scripture I want to just let you know is Ezekiel 34, 17. Okay. That's the first scripture, just so you can look that up for yourself. Um, and it says, as for you, O my flock, that says the Lord, behold, I shall judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and goats. In that same chapter, moving down to verse 20 and 22, it says, thus, therefore, thus says the Lord God to them, behold, I will make myself a judge between the fat and the lean sheep. Because you have pushed with side and shoulder, butted all the weak ones with your horns and scattered them abroad, therefore I will save my flock and they shall no longer be prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep. Okay, so let me break this down to you really quick again. So this is Ezekiel chapter 34. This entire chapter, along with the parallel chapter in Jeremiah, is talking about bad shepherds. Okay. And so this, and so think about what we're talking about, the exposures that are going on. And this, is, so first what the Lord does is that he judges the bad shepherds. The entire chapter of Ezekiel 34 is regards to that. And so we seeing this right now, the judgment of the bad shepherds who have not tended to his sheep according to what his perfect will was for them. 
okay? And so then after he's dealing with the bad shepherds who have not tended to his flock, who have not prepared them for the coming of the Lord, who have not went after the laws, who have not fed them, all of these things. It talks about binding up, not binding up their wounds the, of the injured and so on and so forth, okay? Allowing the wolves to come in, the thieves to come in and steal them. But once he deals with the judgment of the bad shepherd, he then comes back and he judges and separates the sheep from the sheep. So he judges them or he separates the lean from the fat. So what does that mean? So before I go into that, let me take you to another scripture really quick. The other scripture um, that binds with this and what the Lord is saying about the season is in going back a few chapters into Ezekiel chapter 20. And they are verses 37 and 38. And I will read those for you really quick. It says, I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. I will purge the rebels from among you and those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the country where they dwell and they shall not enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Okay, so let's talk about that. First of all, it says I will, you will pass under the rock. So in Psalm 23, the famous, the Lord is my shepherd scripture, right? Remember, he says, David being the psalmist says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. So let's talk about the rod and the staff really quick, okay? So the staff was a hook. And the staff was there to, to pull the sheep up or out, like if they fell into the water, if they fell off into the cliff. What the shepherd would do is that that, that hook that was at the end, they could grasp that underneath the belly, sometimes the head of the sheep, and be able to pull them up or pull them away from danger. Okay, again, if they had fallen into water or fallen off of a cliff, something, some place or gotten themselves into some place, obscure place that the shepherd himself couldn't just put his hands on them and, and rescue them. The staff was there for that. Okay, but then there was a rod and the rod was just a straight, sometimes it was just a, a stick, okay, like a stick off the tree or it was an actual rod. And the rod was for correction. So like as he, as the shepherd would be herding the sheep, you know, the sheep, they're, 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 they like to wander off or what have you. And so to make sure that they stay together, they would take the rod and they would tap them, tap the side or tap their butt or tap their leg to let them know, get into place, get into place. So this scripture says, I will cause you or I will make you pass under the rod okay so that's a rod of correction that the lord is passing the sheep under okay and then he says and i will bring you into the bond of a covenant so it's making a covenant with them and i will purge the rebels from among you so i love that word because rebels are what it's the rebellious it's rebellion so the sheep amongst the sheep are the ones so what is the difference what is the the and we're not even talking about goats. We're not talking about tares here. We're talking about sheep amongst the sheep. So how would we categorize it today? Well, I'm just, I'm telling you, there's there's actually quite a few categories, but we'll just put it like that. Those who are sold out versus those who are lukewarm. I can put it in the most simplest terms. Those who are sold out versus those who are lukewarm. Now, the lukewarm church, I give the example, of course, it's the church of Laodicea that's mentioned in Revelation chapter 3. Again, thought they had everything. They had everything on the outside, but the insides were dirty, like the Pharisees. They didn't watch for the leaven. They had built their tre treasures in this life. They forgot that they were not citizens of this life. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so the versus the ones who understand come come hell or high water, as they say, right? Fire, sleet, rain. <laughs> now we're talking about the mailman. No, but we're talking about people in the body of Christ. In other words, no matter what life has brought to their attention, you know, it doesn't mean that you're perfect. We're going to stumble and we're going to fall. We're going to all make mistakes. Saying, see, see, the thing is, is that the church is amazing with, with, with accusing people of their past or their mistakes or what have you. Satan is the accuser of brethren. That's the end of the story. 
But if we repent it and it's placed under the blood of Jesus, who cares about what somebody on the outside says, as long as you are right with God. So you're going to make mistakes, you're going to stumble, and you're going to fall. The scripture tells us what? That a righteous man falls seven times, right? But gets back up. There was like a famous song that was made <laughs> based on that years ago. And so, but what it means is that if you weigh it in the balances, so to speak, the good, the righteousness, the holiness is going to outweigh that which is of wrong. That's which is wrong. You're not living in wickedness. You're going to make mistakes, but even when you make that mistake or you make that wrong turn, you're quickly recovering from it. You're not staying there for six, seven months or a year, but you're quickly recovering from it. And so this is where the separation is. Those who are allowing themselves to be pliable, those who are willing to deal and face the sins that are lurking at their heart. I'll tell you that scripture real quick to add that in as well. And that goes back to Cain and Abel and Genesis. Remember, after Cain's uh, offering was not accepted, God comes to him. And he's asked him, he says, why is thou countenance fallen? Do you not know that if you two do right, do what is right, then you two will be accepted. So God gave Cain the opportunity to correct his wrong. He said, but if you don't, the sin is that is lurking at your heart and its desire is for you, but you should overcome it, is what he said. But we know that Cain did not overcome it. So the sin that was lurking at his, his heart, this is before Jesus, before the cross, before Calvary, before the blood of the Lamb, before Torah. <laughs> this is now we're talking about the age of consciousness. But yet the Lord was saying to Cain, you, you have the power to overcome this, to not choose darkness. But Cain did not choose the right thing. And so therefore, the sin that was lurking at his heart, that was knocking at the door of his heart, is what eventually produced him to kill his brother, to commit murder. Years later, <laughs> I'm saying years later, but years ago, <laughs> the Lord told me back in 2018, he gave this revelation to me. That the same spirit that was in Cain was in Judas. And I was like, yeah, explain that one to me. I mean, you don't even understand it, but like, well, explain it to me. But he took me back to Genesis, to that scripture that I just quoted to you. And he was saying that the same thing happened to Judas. Because he was, he was a disciple. And the whole time he was with Jesus, he had the opportunity to deal with the sins that was lurking at his heart. Judas was a liar. He was a thief. He was deceptive, and yet he was right there in the midst of all the disciples and the Son of God. He hung out with them, he talked with them, he ministered with them, he witnessed all the wonderful things and the pleasures and the lovely things of Christ that we probably could only dream about. And yet he did not deal with the sin that was lurking in his heart, so it left him to be the candidate for Satan to enter into him. So, because notice the scriptures doesn't say the same did not enter into him until that last Passover. Satan wasn't already in Judas. He did not, but he was, let's just say he was on the outside, but he was not yet on the inside. But it says the devil entered into him. Did the scriptures be fulfilled? He was the perfect candidate because he did not deal with the sins that were lurking in its heart. And so the Lord had given me this word back in 2018. And he said that in that season, in this season, he was saying at that time, he says, I'm allowing my children to deal with the sins that are lurking at their heart in the season. And, and, and later on, a, a few, a couple years later, the Lord spoke to me again. And he was, this is when I was living out of the country and he was talking about another thing. He says, you know, what my children are doing is that and they, they cover their habitual sins with religious routine. And I thought that was super interesting. And, and one of the obvious examples is like, oh, well, you know, I'm having sex outside of marriage. So then I'm going to just get married. Well, no, because that's not always the answer. Even though the Bible says it's better to marry than to burn. But if you've got a lust inside of you, all you've done is just brought that into a covenant now. And you're going to still suffer with the same problem within your marriage that you were suffering outside of it. Trust me, we do marriage counseling all the time here. It's the truth. 
And the Lord was saying they rather cover the habitual sins with religious routine. He says, but what I want to do is I want to expose it so that I can deliver them from it. Again, dealing with the sins that are lurking at the heart. But if we don't allow God to expose these things in our lives so that he can deliver us and purge us and refine us of these things, then what will happen is that darkness will take over. And your lights will go out. He said to the church of Laodicea, because you were neither hot nor cold, but you are lukewarm, I will vomit you or spew you, whichever version of the Bible you got, out of my mouth. Okay, so this is where we're at. Separation of the sheep amongst the sheep. That's the word that the, the, the word, the, the headline that the Lord has given me for this season. Now, I have something else I need to share with you all. And I know we're running out of time, but I, we might, we're going to go a little bit over with this video because of all that I need to share. You know, we've entered into a time of great distress, saints. This season is a season of distress. Um, back in uh, October, I want to say the Lord had given me a time frame. If you all looked at my last video that I did with my friend Joni, I talked about a time frame of about 14 months that put us at the beginning of 2025. We're talking like January of next year. January, February of next year. We're going to see some, we already have. <laughs> We're 18 days into January. Look at what has happened. But remember, I, I said in, in my last video, well, the video before my last video, the one I put out in October, uh, when Israel came out with the war and I said 14 months the Lord has given me we're getting ready to see some horrific things some scary some downright scary frightening things I put this on post on um, um, our social media talked about this on our Bible studies or what have you so those of you who listen to our Bible studies you all know I've said this it's already coming to pass 18 days into the into the new year the, the amount of just horrific things that have happened in across the planet, I, can't, I don't even have time to go into this, but the, the massive amounts of volcanoes that are exploding because hell is expanding her walls. Hell is in the center of the all, earth right now for the time being. Um, from, from the earthquakes and, and um, the volcanoes, we're talking about natural disasters, polar vortexes, um, I think what's interesting is the amount of flooding. I don't know if you all have paid attention to this. The amount of flooding, catastrophic flooding in the most unusual places like Saudi Arabia in the in Yemen. I don't know if you guys saw this like a month and a half ago or so. Maybe it's been a month and a half. An uh, actual hurricane hit Yemen. We're talking about the Horn of Africa where it's, Bedouin land, basically arid, dry, desert, camels, <laughs> all of that good stuff, okay? A hurricane actually came through there. They had so much flooding in Saudi Arabia that it actually turned the sand, parts of the sand dunes, I'm not, and you can go Google this. They're green. It's unreal. It's green with grass. What was nothing but just arid desert dust and sand. It's green. So I find that to be interesting. And so those are natural disasters. But then we've got, you know, the people coming out about um, extraterrestrials who were really fallen angels walking around in malls. And, and, and some people don't believe that it's true. Listen, this stuff is real. If, if they're silencing people on it, nobody wants to talk about it. You know, then more people are coming out with it on certain uh, social media platforms. And some of the eyewitnesses are coming out. They first came out, then they came out and said, no, I'm just joking. But it, there's a lot of stuff that's proving that this thing actually happened. And uh, I found out some more information that I'm not allowed to share with you on social media. But also let you know that it was also a real thing. That happened. So we got all this bizarre stuff. And then the the if you paid attention, and, and again, these are the signs. Um, the amount of of not just impending wars like with Taiwan and China or the continuous war with Ukraine and, and Russia or Israel and Hamas or even the threats here in the United States, but 
but more the talking about um, the rioting, the uprising of people overthrowing governments and protesting in places like Germany and places like Ecuador um, and places like Italy. Like it's a lot of crazy stuff. We've got queens that have resigned in Denmark. Um, and there's just, just this massive changing of the guard states. And again, I'll do a podcast and go more into detail about those things because we need to pay attention to those things because all of this is shaping into the one world, what will be the one world order. They, they've had a world economic, um, the world economic forum, the WEF has had another meeting and interesting. I found it interesting. The title of this meeting was calling, was talking about rebuilding trust, ha ha ha, right? Rebuilding trust. And then there was some uh, footage that came out about that where they did some weird Native American seance at the World Economic Forum, uh, calling ancestral spirits to come and bless the meeting. And we know that those are demons. And so there's just a lot of stuff that is going on right now. And it's all, the world is on fire. The world is on fire because the, the chaos has to be produced for the people to call for peace. And we know that the peace that is coming will not be a true peace, but a false peace. And so we're on, we're right there, saints. We're on the precipice. And then in April of this year, we here in the United States will come to the end of a, a near seven-year cycle with another final total solar eclipse. And I do say final because the next one is, I, I don't know, it's not due for another 60 years in this country. I believe it is 60 years or maybe it's 2060 or something like that. So it's the final one for this country. And I've been talking about this on and off since 2017, since I did my live video on Facebook in August of 2017 at that time when I was talking about a pandemic coming. We're at the end of this near seven year cycle, which I talk about in our newsletter um, that we're putting out this January. I go into detail about some very interesting findings that I haven't found nobody else talk about, uh, linked to um, numbers in the Hebraic as to what this final eclipse means for the America. And that's what I want to finish with. So, as a whole for this country, the Lord gave me this scripture and it's Isaiah chapter 21. Now I'm not going to go over that with you today. Like I normally do in my other videos. It is only 10 verses. So I, I encourage all of you to take a look at this scripture. He gave it to me in the wee hours of the morning, which is typically when I'm up praying and the Lord speaks to me anyways, during the fourth watch. And it was several weeks ago, it was less than a month ago, but several weeks ago. And he said to me, Isaiah chapter 21, I went and got up uh, to look at the scripture. And the title of the scripture is The Fall of Babylon. I'm going to read just one verse for you. And that is verse 9. And verse nine says, and look, here comes the chariot of men with a pair of horsemen. And then he answered and said, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. And all the carved images of her gods has broken to the ground. So the chapter interestingly is about a watchman or Isaiah being at the watchtower looking for the sign of war coming there you go so it's about war coming and Babylon has fallen has fallen is what the scripture says again 10 verses go and look at it take a look at it read it allow the Holy Spirit to give you revelation insight um, the Lord gave me that scripture for this season for this country in particular this country is going to fall and it's going to catch a lot of people in the church off guard because there is a snare that is going to be set up to make them think that things are going to go one way, but it is an absolute trap and it is going to go the other way. And that is what I can't talk about here on this particular channel, but I will put it out in a podcast. 
Um, I do have a Rumble account that I'm slowly but surely putting together. And I did that because um, one of my main videos that was put out two and a half years ago now was taken down. It was about the final outpouring. Um, the only video in 10 years that has ever been taken down. But I uploaded it to my Rumble account. So you can go search for Faithful Walk Healing Ministry, specifically that. Don't look for my name. Look for the ministry title on Rumble and subscribe to us there. But I will put out a podcast. There is a, there is some things that are going to happen in this country that are going to make the evangelicals think that it's going to be good, but it's not going to be good. And the Lord has come to me four times regarding this, where I've had to warn the church and tell them that this will be the, quote, the final nail in the coffin for the evangelical church. Well, Mina, what does that mean? What I'm saying is going back to what I said in the beginning about that double-edged sword. Because what we're going into next, saints, is the persecution, the total global persecution of the saints before the shofar sounds. Okay? So, in the meantime, in the meantime, it's really important. Now, I'm going to say this, too. Some of you all, and again, this video is not going to be for everybody. It never is. None of them ever are. But especially this one, okay? Especially with a lot of the little backlashes, the little, you know, jabs here and there that people have been trying to do recently with this ministry. I really genuinely don't care what other people think. Um, I care about what God thinks. And so for those who really have ears to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying in the season, these words will resonate with you. But nevertheless... Make sure you take it to prayer because I always say, take everything to prayer. Don't even follow the, this ministry. We don't follow us. Follow Christ. I'm a flawed individual, okay? I, I, my track record proves just that. But make sure that you are the Lord. See, the thing is, when you have that relationship with the Lord, he will. He said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, his word to be established. I've, shed, I've said this before. What that means is that not you go to one conference or one YouTube video and then you get one word and then you go to another one and go to another. That is not what that means. It says, out of the mouth of the two or three witnesses, his word will be established, meaning that he told you first, meaning that you have a relationship with God, with Christ, with the son, with the king, with the bridegroom, the lover of your soul. And he has revealed something to you, and then you get it confirmed because the Holy Spirit is on one accord. You can get it confirmed through other witnesses or things of that nature. But see, people people don't have that, that intimate relationship, so they're missing it. And therefore, it goes back to what I said in the beginning, the enemy is coming in. There's a vulnerability. Your gates are not checked. It's no different than a, a, a thief walking down a, a road at night pulling car doors to see what nut left there doors unlocked. We have these unchecked gates in our life. We have many gates. We have eye gates, ear gates, heart gates, all of these. And we leave these gates unchecked. And the enemy is coming and pulling car doors, so to speak, in the spirit realm to see, did you lock your gates? And too many of us have unlocked gates. And there's these vulnerable spots in our souls and in our lives, saints, that the enemy is coming in and deceiving us in. Okay. So we have to be airtight, locked, solid in Jesus Christ. So even the things that I'm sharing with you, take it to prayer. Some of you will look at this video and say, hey, the Lord has already shared this with me. I've already felt this in my spirit. You're confirming it. That's great. Some of you will say, well, I don't know. Take it to prayer. Take it to prayer for confirmation. Okay? Some of you all have been told have been given some instructions for this year. Some of you need to move and to relocate. Some of that moving needs to be moving out of state, out of city, out of town, out of a neighborhood. Some of you, it may be your job. Some of you may be called away from family members or just things that are familiar to you. And I'm telling you today that you've got until the end of this year to do it. And when I say the end of the year, I'm talking like you've got nine months. Things are getting ready to change really rapidly, saints. Globally, the economy is shifting, okay? The church is shifting. The world is shifting. And it's not going in a good way. And so... Wherever it is that God wants you to be and needs you to be, get there. 
Don't waste any time. Stop dragging your feet. Stop looking at that which is familiar around you. Stop allowing familiarity to be your snare. That's a word that the Lord has given my husband the last two months. He's been emphasizing that, been teaching his men's Bible study, his one-on-one -on -one mentoring, because he mentors young men. He teaches men's Bible study every other Shabbat um, in the mornings. Um, and then conferences, he has words, and we have our meetings, and God, the Holy Spirit falls on him, and he prophetically gives people individual words and all this stuff. But he's been talking about this familiarity thing. And he was like, this is, the Lord was sharing with him that this is going to be many believers' snares in this season. That which is familiar. That's a lot of things. That which makes you comfortable. Now that could be your, that could be from your family member to your, your pint of ice cream. But the enemy knows what our vulnerabilities and our familiarities are. And he will use it against us to keep us complacent. I'll, I'll add, to keep us deaf and dumb in the spirit. Remember the sons of Issachar knew the season. There's not a lot of sons of Issachar in this season. People are just completely distracted. And the enemy will use so many things all the way down to sickness in your body. He will use to distract you. I've been through that. I went through that last year. I shared an amazing testimony about how the Lord allowed me to go through this, this ailments in my body for a year. He came and told me, I'm going to heal your body. And as soon as he said that, everything fell apart. <laughs> and, and, but he, but he, through that, the testimony came out and I mean, I was, my body was completely healed and I praised God for it, but it was a lesson. He told me, he says, now you're going to go share this. And I ended up sharing it with other people and, and bringing breakthroughs into the lives, sharing it in a women's group and all of this stuff where it talks about that and uh, how Satan steals our identity through distractions. And he will even use sickness as a distraction. So be aware of that. Okay. So make sure that you are doing exactly what the Lord has told you to do with this season because the safest place to be, you can, you can stock up on pork and beans and water and you can put cash in and cash out and gold and silver and, and you can buy doomsday bunkers and, and non-perishable foods and you can do all of that and, and, and N95 mask or whatever. But if you are not in the perfect will of God. It doesn't matter. The perfect and safe place to be in this season is in the perfect will of the Most High. Okay. That's where you got to be. You got to be under the perfect will of the Most High. And so make sure that you're not dragging your feet this year. Again, we're going to see some catastrophic things, more catastrophic things this year, globally, but also here in this country especially from the end of this year going into the beginning of next year. But we'll also look at that solar eclipse and look for the shifting because it also happens at the beginning of the biblical new year on top of that. It happens on that day of the Bible. And, and again, that's a changing of the season because the biblical calendar from spring to spring is the proper calendar, so to speak. Okay. And that eclipse falls in the beginning of a new season. So it's a sign. And remember, the, the omens of the solar eclipses are assigned to the, to the Gentile nations, as in the, the, with the lunar eclipses, it's assigned um, to Israel. Okay? So be on the lookout for these things. I mean, yes, understand it. But again, make sure the inside, make sure your house, your house is in check. Your gates are locked. The thief cannot come in to steal, to kill, to destroy, to plunder, and to sift as wheat. Because remember, Satan's desire is to sift you as wheat. That is where we're at. We're in, we have to allow a God to, and again, and shed, and I'll say this and let it go, to shed that familiarity, which is really, really, really important because of the persecution that we're going into. The persecution that is about to take place, I've said it, is unprecedented in this country. What we're going to see here in this country, it's already begun, saints. But that gentleman from Denmark, the Lord told me on a Wednesday morning, I'll never forget it. He said, I sent him here. He is a sign to the church of what's coming. 
And he told me that in October of 2022. And I shared it in the beginning of 2023. And, and like I said, this double-edged sword of exposure, and you're going to see more exposures. And, and some, and we've had some, let me add this. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Let me share this with you all. The Holy Spirit just brought this to my attention. This happened to me last Thursday, no, last Wednesday, and I wrote it down. I, um... I went into spontaneous worship on the Wednesday morning. I wasn't anticipating this. I was actually trying to get out of my house. But I had worship music on and I felt the presence of the Lord really hit me. And I went into the spontaneous worship and the presence of God fell on me really, really heavy. And I actually shared this in my Bible study last week. And it was bec and and I was asking the Lord about my God sister. So my God sister passed away, and I had just gotten the phone call the day prior, and we had been friends since I was 19 years old. Okay, and she wasn't well. She she had a lot of health ailments, and unfortunately, she ended up passing away. And so in my worship, I I within my heart, I was just I I felt she was with her. But, or with her, excuse me, forgive me. <laughs> I felt that she had gone home to be with the Lord. Him. By the way, let me make sure I correct that. Him. Um, but I, I just, there was just something in my soul that wanted to confirm that. And so I, I asked. I asked the Lord, like, is, is she with you, you know? And the Lord told me that she was with him. And I was like, okay, you know, like I was asking this within my heart, within my soul. I didn't voice it with my physical mouth. And I left it at that, right? That was my answer. But no, the Lord continued to talk. And um, as he was speaking, I realized what he was telling me I needed to write down. So like I grabbed this random envelope piece of mail that I had and a pen and I started writing this down. And I'm going to share it with you. And so what he said to me is that, that this year, he said he would call many more of his children home by the end of this year. There would be many more. And when I say many, I'm not, I mean, I don't have a number. Okay. I'm not, told, he's, but listen to me. He said he was called, he was going to call many more home by the end of this year to spare them from what was coming, to spare them. So hear me out with that, okay? And my god sister was, she had a lot of sickness in her body. She had a lot of ailments in her body. She had been suffering for years with it. And she wasn't married. And um, so she was alone. And when you look at it as a whole, it was, the Lord taking her home was a good thing. It was a good thing. And he said, there's many more I'm going to take home this year, by the end of this year specifically, to spare them for what's getting ready to come here. And then he said, no, to those who remain that are part. This is his children, those who he's called, those who, he, who he's chosen, okay? I'm not talking about the world. The separation, those who have passed under the rod, let me specify that. Those who remain, he said to me, know that they have been prepared for a time such as this. And he was speaking to me about that. And so what he's saying, and, and we really don't need any further interpretation, but it means that He's given us, he's equipped us with what we need to get through what's getting ready to happen. I want you to remember that because last Tabernacles, this is past Tabernacles a few months ago, what the Lord told me, he gives me words for myself, like my individual self. And I don't typically share those, but I'm going to share this piece with you. Okay. Cause I never share this part. It's always like, you know, what he wants me to know. Like I talked about him telling me he was going to heal my body a couple years ago. And it was on Yom Kippur. Well, this season, he told me that, he was telling me, like, whatever, like, to make sure 
not to operate or not to react on impulse. And the scripture he gave me had to do with not allowing fear to come in. And I've shared with my group, I said, you know, I'm not a, a scary person. I'm just, I'm not a panic person at all. I've been fashioned <laughs> not to be that person. I'm not emotionally driven. That's why I, I don't really often care about what people say about me or what have you. I'm, I don't have to defend myself or I'm, I'm not a panicky person. I'm not a, you know, I'm just not that type of person. So even in like high adrenaline situations, like I'm usually the person that can think straight and my kids know this about me. My family knows this about me or what have you. And so for the Lord to come to me and say, listen, I want you to make sure you focus on me and like not the things around you. That let me know that what was coming was going to be pretty darn frightening. Okay, so I'm sharing that with you. So again, he said this to me last, going back to what he said to me last Wednesday. Those who remain, those who he's not going to call home, to know that we have been designed, prepared for a time such as this. So he's equipped you with you what you need, everything you need to overcome, no matter what the circumstances is. Like I said, I had a dream this morning about people being falsely imprisoned and accused here in this country. Whatever it is, no, he's equipped you. He's equipped you to get through what's coming. Time is so incredibly short, saints. Like, the door is almost closing. And he allowed me to see that too. I had a vision. I was in my bathroom while brushing my teeth. And I had a vision and the Lord appeared next to me. And he just simply said, I'm coming. Are you ready? And in that moment, he, he allowed me to feel how close it was. And it felt like it was going to happen today, that day. In fact, it felt like it was getting ready to happen within a few minutes of him saying it. Like I felt it in the inner core being of my soul. And all I could do was cry. And say yes, yes. And I want to encourage you all with that in closing. Like some of us are tired. I'm tired. I am. It's, it's not like I've lived for 90 years. I've been on this planet pushing a half a century now. My children have grown. I've, I've seen a lot of things. I've been through a lot of things that most of you will never know about. It's the portion that God has given me. It was hard a school of hard knocks <laughs> lots of trials lots of tribulations lots of mistakes but lots of growth but i've watched this earth deteriorate it, it wasn't this bad when i was a kid when i was a teenager when i was in my 20s it's it's so bad now it's so incredibly bad and it's wearisome on the soul if you're longing to see his face. It's wearisome. It's taxing on the soul. But I want you to know he's coming. So hang in there. It's it's almost over. It's it's literally almost over. Just hang in there, saints. He's coming for his bride. So I'm gonna leave you with that today. Thank you so much for letting me into your homes as always. Share this video with the other members of the body of Christ leadership and common folk the same. Study the scriptures. Take it to prayer for confirmation. And until next time, everybody, God bless you all and shalom.